Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for Community Progress, I'd like to welcome you to today's Cornerstone webinar. My name is Justin Goddard and I serve as the Senior Program Officer for National Leadership and Education here at Community Progress. Cornerstone is our webinar series which equips participants with the building blocks to understand and solve tough challenges related to property vacancy, abandonment, and deterioration. For today's Cornerstone, we are joined by Tarek Abdelazim, excuse me, Tarek Abdelazim, who serves as Director of National Technical Assistance here at Community Progress. In his role, he assists with the oversight, coordination, and delivery of a range of technical assistance and capacity building services to urban, rural, and suburban communities across the country. Tarek has helped communities design and launch innovative programs that have become models in the national field of practice and has co-authored seminal publications on the land banking movement nationally and within New York State. His work reflects a strong commitment to centering racial equity in the broader field of community development. Before turning it over to Tarek, I want to mention that we will allow time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your webinar browser and type your question into the Q&A box. We will share presentation slides and a video recording of today's presentation in the days following. If you experience any technical difficulties, please send us a message by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your browser or by sending an email to myself at jgoddard at communityprogress.net. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Tarek. Thank you, Justin. As always, appreciate your excellence in organizing this Cornerstone webinar. It's great to be here with everybody. I am gonna get us started here. So I typically am a walker talker when we do these presentations. So now that I am trapped at my seat, I have learned that all of that energy ends up going into wild gest gesticulation of my hands. So just <laughs> bear with me as we get through this. It's great to be able to share space with everyone today and appreciate you uh, chiming in. As Justin said, these slide deck, this slide deck will be shared with all participants. There'll be a recording available on our website afterwards. And whatever questions we can't get to today, uh, I will do my best to answer uh, as many of them as possible with some follow-up and that will also be included. So a quick presentation outline. Um, this really is a, a session intended as an introduction to land banks. So for those seasoned land banks, practitioners. I'm sorry if I might bore you a bit, um, but this really is kind of as an opening into the field of land bankings and the content is designed as such. So we're going to spend some time establishing some common ground. Um, we're going to do an overview of land banks, really what are they, what are their roles. Um, look at uh, through a national scan, kind of highlight some of the common mistakes and where there has been innovation in the field. And then moving forward, particularly in the context of COVID-19, uh, the strong desire for racial equity and an equitable recovery. We'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to meet that moment in support of all of your work. So I think since many of you are here, you know about Center for Community Progress. We were founded in 2010. We are a national nonprofit that serves as the leading resource to help communities address vacant, abandoned, and deteriorated properties. I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach in the introduction slide. So I'll just say we're, you know, a nimble but a crafty crew of about 20 employees. We have some place-based dedicated staff and capacity in both the state of Michigan as well as the state of Georgia. And then the national technical assistance teams provide support through the rest of the country. We also do a lot of educational programming um, and we have boosted our capacity in policy and research. So when we say establishing common ground, I'd like to one just talk about the approach that Center for Community Progress takes in working with communities on addressing uh, problem properties, right? If we, we have to be very sensitive to the history of fighting blight in our country because that really, that, that lived experience has often been traumatic and tragic to people of color. Um, and so as we're talking about land banks as governmental entities that are gonna come in and be dedicated to 
addressing blight, we really need to be thoughtful and mindful about how we approach this and acknowledge this history. You know, at the start of the 20th century, there's many efforts at the local levels to actually institutionalize segregation through race-based zoning ordinances. Uh, I think there has been a very robust conversation in the last few years about redlining and the impacts that that had in shaping the trajectory of so many of our neighborhoods and the disparities that we see therein. Right? Redlining was uh, the federal governments providing guidance to local appraisers and assessors really in which they would go around and characterize neighborhoods as to their riskiness for mortgage products. With the government playing a far more role in insuring mortgages, they really wanted to basically limit their risk. And that resulted in many neighborhoods being deemed hazardous simply by the presence of black folks and immigrants. Uh, and so that you could see on the map here is one of those red line maps those neighborhoods that were redlined were basically those folks were denied access to traditional mortgage property or mortgage products, which meant not only then was there a lack of private investment in those neighborhoods, but public investment was also redirected to those neighborhoods that were blue and green. At the same time, and this is kind of the, the, the pair to redlining, is as many developers started to build out large subdivisions in communities there is similar policy that resulted in extreme unjust practices in that the government would say that we will only insure these large development loans if the developer agrees to include race-based restrictive covenants on each one of those homes, which basically prohibited any of those homes from being sold to black purchasers. So those two policies by the federal government locked folks into ghettos that were then and, and going forward many decades denied investments experienced concentration of prog uh, po uh, poverty, but at the same time that policy then denied them access to neighborhoods of opportunity that we would call now. And finally, urban renewal, we're very familiar with this. A lot of in our communities can point to neighborhoods that were decimated and that work disproportionately impacted black homeowners and business owners across the country and literally created physical instruments of segregation. When we do our approach, it's a data-driven approach as well. And there's three buckets of data that we work with communities on. Uh, one, we really need to understand parcel data, right? If we can aggregate, analyze, map, and better understand the indicators of distress, communities are in a much better position not only to tackle those, the systemic vacancy, but also prevent and be proactive kind of with an early warning system. So these key indicators, delinquent property taxes, uh, code violations, code liens, utility shutoffs. Usually we say if water's been shut off for six months or more, you can assume that that's vacant. And again, aggregating all these data points helps incredibly at the local level and in your strategies. At the same time, we want to understand the market data. Now, we know that many of those unjust housing, lending, and land use policies did shape the trajectory of our neighborhoods with great disparities between them. And so there are many communities that have hot neighborhoods, hot market neighborhoods right next to, you know, struggling or weak housing market neighborhoods. And it's important to understand those market conditions because we don't want to apply some of our strategies universally across all the neighborhoods. Uh, an aggressive traditional code enforcement practice may work very well in a strong housing market it could actually exacerbate vacancy and harm vulnerable homeowners in weak housing markets. So we w work with communities to design strategies, but also tailor them to the local market conditions. And the third bucket of data, which is the most important is social data. What it means is really centering residents who are most impacted by vacancy and abandonment, not just in the design of the solutions, but also in implementation. Community of prog uh, Progress takes a systems-based approach to the challenges that communities face from vacant and abandoned properties. And the way I like to talk about this slide is that property owners generally have two primary responsibilities when it comes to their uh, commitment to the public good, right? We are not just asset managers that exist in a vacuum inside a structure. We are neighbors. We are part of a block. We are part of the neighborhood fabric. And so two primary responsibilities that you have that the others on the block is one, keep up with your property repairs and keep up with your taxes. Now, we know that if somebody slips in either one of those responsibilities, 
it's not necessarily out of malfeasance or intentional neglect. It can very well be somebody living paycheck to paycheck that loses their job, um, that experiences financial hardship because of a sudden health crisis, right? So when we talk with communities about addressing this, it's so important that we make sure that there are equitable off-ramps of these systems, right? No, it's code enforcement and delinquent property tax enforcement are the two legal systems that we use in order to address and prevent vacancy and abandonment. Um, and we just have to make sure that, again, there's equitable off-ramps. Um, in the goal always is compliance, right? The goal always is compliance. But where we do have vacant and abandoned properties or property owners that are clearly just being intentionally neglectful with resources, then we wanna make sure that these systems work efficiently and effectively. In other words, these are the two pipelines by which a government has leverage in order to move vacant and abandoned properties that are harming the neighborhood through a process that we can then compel a transfer of ownership. Now, the, excuse me while I take a quick sip. There are many communities that wanna talk about land banks, land banks, without really necessarily understanding that if these two, these two legal pipelines aren't efficient and effective, then we're gonna have a challenge of even building a portfolio of properties that the land bank can temporarily acquire and address. So it's really important, I'm seeing some Q&A and I just wanna make sure, aha, okay. And Justin, if I may, if, if there is a question uh, that comes up clarifying just something that I said or something on the slide, please feel free to stop me. Otherwise, if there are broader questions, we'll wait to the end. So it's really important to understand the property tax enforcement systems and what are the options across the country, right? I, this is not an inconsequential point because if we were to look at the entire inventory of land banks across this country, look at their portfolio, probably 85 to 90% of all the properties came through this property tax uh, enforcement system. There are many times in which once a land bank is created, all of the existing publicly owned properties are moved to the land bank, that's fine, but any additional properties, almost all of them come through this property tax enforcement system. Every state is different, we have to go in, understand the legal statutes, where are their barriers. Their systems are not always optimal. In fact, they're quite antiquated and challenging to actually move forward with land banks. But let's look at what happens with a delinquent tax lien. There are generally two options, and I have to be very broad here. In, of course, there's incredible nuance in every state. But governments can do one of two things. They can either sell the debt. So maybe after a year has gone by and the tax, and the tax bill hasn't been paid, the government can say, you know what, who wants to buy this debt and go out to the private market and sell these at auction to investors? Basically what the government is, gets in return is immediate cash flow, right? So if they have financial challenges, they need to keep the lights on at the park, pay for first responders, et cetera. Uh, they, they need that cash year and a year in basis. The problem is it transfers the incredible power of foreclosure over to an, a private investor. And so if we go back to that screen where we see that those pipelines, those pipelines basically don't exist in a community that sells tax liens. There can be few properties, but very few. Now the other option is for the government to actually hold that debt for a year, two years, three years, again, depending on what the tax statutories uh, and, and statutes and laws are in your state and what you're allowed at the local municipality. But generally, let's say they hold that debt for two to three years, then they can actually pursue a foreclosure action through the courts, a judicial in rem foreclosure action. They then either take title or they can send that out to the private bidders at speculative auction. Here, they're actually selling the dirt, not the debt, they're selling the title to the property. Oftentimes, and there's a lot of nuance here, is where bidders don't make a, or, or if nobody bids on a property, then it falls into what's often called like the real estate division in a city hall or county government, 
where it kind of serves as an in-house land banking program, right? Nobody wanted it, so the, now the county and city has to take it, and then they can still use their own procurement and disposition policies. The other alternative is to actually create a land bank. And so if nothing is sold at the auction, it goes to the land bank. Now, land banks are also given special powers where they can actually jump ahead of all of the bidders and speculators at an auction. There are some communities that have decided to just ignore and eliminate the auction altogether. Two examples right here in New York, where I'm, I'm working remotely from, Syracuse and Albany, they, do no, they no longer auction off any property. They do the foreclosure and they transfer every property over to their land bank. So I bring out SpongeBob SquarePants whenever there's a really important point. So the land bank should be seen as a more thoughtful alternative to the speculative auction. It ensures the transfer of tax foreclosed properties to responsible buyers in order to generate predictable outcomes consistent with community priorities. A lot of words, but really important point there, right? You're bringing property in under temporary public ownership. You have more flexibility in vetting your owners or buyers, potential transferees, and you could also sell it at a lower price in order to get the best outcome. So now let's unpack that a little more. And what is a land bank? So a land bank is a public authority or nonprofit focuses on the conversion of these problem properties, right? There are more than 200 land banks nationwide. The overwhelming majority have been created following the Great Recession. Not a surprise, right? As we saw uh, the kind of the wreckage of that uh, economic crisis and financial meltdown, uh, there are many communities that were turning to land banks in order to help them deal with the historic legacy of distressed properties, right, in many legacy cities, but also the new wave of foreclosures and abandoned properties that the Great Recession wrought. Now, over 80% of these land banks are created pursuant to comprehensive state enabling legislation, and that's key because land banks are literally given special powers through state legislation that allows them to intervene in that tax foreclosure process more cost effectively and allows them to carry out that work more efficiently and pursuant to more equitable outcomes. Michigan, Ohio, New York, Georgia, and Pennsylvania states are the highest number of land banks. In fact, 75% of all the land banks in the country are in these five states. They also, Pennsylvania was the most recent, they all have state land bank associations, and some of them are incredible resource and network and information sharing and peer-to-peer and -peer learning. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that later at the end because there's some implications with another initiative we're pursuing, the National Land Bank Network. Oh, just very quickly, there are a couple states on this slide that are not highlighted. Kentucky has a land bank legislation that allows Louisville with very weak powers, and Kansas also has some land bank legislation at the state level. We don't include all of them because sometimes the powers are so minimal and the land bank legislation does very little to help, again, intervene in that tax foreclosure process cost effectively that sometimes we choose not to highlight them, but there are some other states that have very, very limiting land bank legislation. And we're hoping to improve this because this map, I'm not a big fan of it. It seems to suggest that every state legislation is equal, and it certainly is not. <laughs> it's hard for us to grade it, but there are definitely ones that are more optimal, and there are ones that are very deficient. So what are the key powers? And I was just speaking to this. It's right, land banks authorized through state enabling legislation are only as powerful and flexible as the statute that created them. One, can the land bank acquire tax foreclosed property cost effectively? There are many states that have what's called priority bid or even credit bid. That means a land bank can go to the auction where they're selling the debt, the actual property, and basically jump ahead of all the speculators with a priority bid. If the minimum bid was $8,000 on a property, the land bank can say, we'd like that, pull it into the portfolio. If no one else bids, there are even some states that say, we'll recognize that as a credit bid. In other words, you don't even have to pay it because the work that you're going to do to put this back to productive use, right, and get a quality outcome is basically uh, an investment that we're going to recognize. 
There are also land bank legislations that allow land banks to extinguish liens and clear title. Now, it's incredibly important that through this process, land banks do end up with clear title, so it actually can attract market nonprofit partners to invest in that, pro in that property. Many land banks are able to hold property tax exempt. We're working with a land bank in Tennessee where the nonprofits are not tax exempt, so the land bank can actually play a role in basically allowing CDCs and affordable housing providers uh, to basically deposit their land into the land bank, which then holds the tax exempt for a minimal charge, and then can with uh, the entity can withdraw those properties when it's ready to actually do the project after it's gathered, it, after it's gathered its financing. There are some revenue opportunities in state land bank legislation, but limited. We'll talk about some of the best. And then here's the other most important thing. It can acquire properties cost effectively, and at the back end, it can transfer them out. The eligible transferees that are vetted, that are responsible, that can be prioritized, and it's driven by the outcome, not the highest price. Again, there's just a lot of chatter. Okay, just checking the comments there. So when is land bank the right tool, right? What we always work with communities first and say, what are you trying to solve, right? Do you understand what the problem, uh, the inventory of problem properties truly is? In many cases, it can just be that uh, a more proactive and strategic code enforcement can address some of your challenges. So it's really understanding, you know, the proper conditions that a land bank can be very effective. Is there weak economic conditions? Is there systemic vacancy and poverty? Is there one neighborhood that is wrecked by disinvestment, a pattern, a legacy of, of historical policies? Sudden shocks. It's no surprise that our organization was the merger of two organizations, one working in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and one up in Genesee County, Michigan, that one of those legacy cities that were dealing with deindustrialization, depopulation, right? So it's either of those economic crises or man-made natural disasters can create large uh, inventories of vacancy and abandonment, which a land bank could be a tool that could be very helpful. I always like to show this slide because it shows that land banks are not always a viable solution. We worked with Las Vegas, Nevada. There was uh, a large inventory of vacant properties, but the more we dug into that actual portfolio, we realized that many of them were bank-owned. They were REO properties after the Great Recession where the market had collapsed, and so the bank went through the foreclosure and just basically kept them off the market. They were waiting for the prices to rebound before they would put them back out in order to try to minimize their losses. So. A land bank really has no leverage to access that portfolio and subset of vacant properties. There are different approaches and solutions that they would need to pursue in order to address that particular uh, set of vacancy. In Florida, there is a state law that mandates that jurisdictions must first offer all tax liens to investors. Obviously, if we go back to that slide that we talked about, that's why I like to start this conversation with that slide. You could see then that it doesn't even allow for a pipeline of uh, foreclosed properties to feed into a land bank. So we've had many communities in Florida call us, particularly after the Great Recession, right, when there was again a fallout and large degree of vacancy. And we said the problem is, is that you have a state law that mandates you do this. And so it really precludes your ability to move forward with an effective uh, land bank. There are some key elements of effective land banks. It will always need some level of support, cash or in-kind, that's proportion, proportional to the scope and scale of vacancy and blight is expected to resolve. I get into this in one of those key lessons in, in, in the next set of slides, so I'm gonna leave it there. One of the key goals is recognize this is not about making money, right? I mean, if this was about making money, those properties wouldn't be there. The private market would have taken them. This is about maximizing outcome, and the more uh, uh, what we push is maximizing equitable outcomes. Now, if you look at the right here, uh, these are all the keys. Like a land bank cannot operate in a vacuum. It cannot. It is not a silver bullet. 
It needs to be connected to the tax foreclosure process and state law needs to contemplate how that integration exists. It needs to be aligned with other blight strategies, right? There needs to be coordination among the housing and building code enforcement, among data analysis at the government, working with your residents and centering their needs, uh, partnering with affordable housing providers and many others. And then I think most important, and it gets back to that history of government fighting blight, you absolutely have to make sure that all of your transactions are driven by policy, they're transparent, and that you're accountable, right? Uh, th this is just critical. Land banks cannot in even the slightest even be perceived as operating in secrecy or without, you know, the, the neighborhoods, the neighbors in the neighborhoods that you're working in. It's just so important that you maintain and constantly build that trust with those whose your, your, your work is inevitably going to be uh, involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, partnerships are required, right? A land bank clearly is going to be pulling in a bunch of real estate assets, so it needs folks that can actually repurpose those assets. And if we just look at vacant land, you can see there are many local groups that are interested in urban agriculture, from community gardens to large-scale urban farms and, and, and enterprises from pocket parks, uh, those who want to ensure that every child has access within half a mile, uh, access to green space and pocket parks, uh, expanding uh, or selling some of these vacant lots to homeowners or property owners immediately adjacent to expand their yard. Uh, obviously, climate resiliency is a huge concern. So how can vacant land be repurposed for green stormwater infrastructure or in other ways to improve resiliency? And then of course, infill affordable housing, the land bank does not do all this. The land bank should be considered more as a broker of land on behalf of the public, right? That is going to ensure, again, predictable outcomes with responsible owners, with goals that meet the community priorities. How are land banks funded? Uh, not sufficiently. <laughs> uh, this remains one of the biggest challenges for land banks, obviously, this inventory, again, because of financial or legal barriers or because it is within a weak housing market, does not necessarily attract the private market. There is always going to need to be some public subsidy and investment in order to turn around uh, in the large economic conditions of these neighborhoods that can then eventually attract the private investment. There are some bill uh, within the legislative uh, state legislation where some of the tax proceeds from a property that went through uh, the land bank can go back to the land bank for five years. That's this tax recapture 550 provision. Again, it doesn't generally uh, generate a lot of revenue, but it's something that helps. Typically, it, it really has to be through local governments, through foundations, through philanthropic support, through grants. And we'll talk a, a bit about some of those key uh, funding that we've seen the last few years. So now if we look, uh, before I go to that next session again, just really quick. Uh, Aha, uh -huh. folks, uh, you're, you're getting to some of the slides later, so that's good. I'm gonna wait to answer those then. It's important, let's just look at the largest inventories in the countries. These numbers were of 2019, last year we know, unprecedented, traumatic, tragic. Uh, we kind of had a pause with a lot of our conversations and engagements, giving folks grace and space to deal with the urgent priorities in their community. So sorry that this information is a little outdated, but given most places also had a pause on tax foreclosures, um, they're probably not too far off, but you can see it varies widely from 100,000 in Detroit land bank to you know, 500,000 in New York, I would also say that there are many land banks, the, the rest of them are just, while there might be a few more in the 500, 800, 300, the overwhelming majority are below 100. Some of them just have three, five, 10, 20. Uh, it really also depends on, again, the scope and scale of the blight that they're trying to solve, as well as their capacity and access to resources. Now, one of the reasons why you see such large numbers here is because some of these, particularly Michigan, Ohio, they had access to hardest hit funds, which was part of the uh, uh, America God, I, Restore and Recovery Act. <laughs> this is after the Great Recession. It's so far, and now we're talking American Rescue Plan, so sorry. 
but after the Great Recession, there was some money peeled off to go to hardest hit funds. It was primarily to help uh, for homeowners stay in their home, to help rewrite their mortgages, uh, refinance them. But then it was also demolition was made an eligible activity. And so Michigan, Ohio, and others carried out very large-scale demolition campaigns dealing with a long-standing inventory that they never thought they would be able to address uh, for, for decades. And so that's why you see some of these large numbers because they pulled those properties into their inventory after demolition. So one of the things that we like to do is just talk about what are some common mistakes, particularly when we get calls all the time from communities, we want to start a land bank, we want to start a land bank, and those that move forward. Um, one is, you know, make sure that you have a clear understanding of what the problem is you're trying to solve. Again, is it extensive? Is it something that can be dealt through other tools and systems? Or, is land, or will a land bank actually be uh, incredibly helpful in addressing this? So these get back to the data points that I was talking about earlier. You do not need a, a robust software platform that is going to aggregate all these, these data points. Now, there are some products out there that are helpful, but just pull folks together from different departments, share spreadsheets on, on a piece of paper. Some of this work can start in those conversations just with interdepartmental communication and talking about which, which problems are, which properties are causing the most harm. Now there is a great example, Cuyahoga County Land Bank, um, where they're pulling together all of the different market data, parcel data, social data, and they actually use this then when they have this large inventory of tax foreclosures, 20, 30,000, whatever that may be across the county, and they can only move forward maybe a thousand because of capacity. They use this system and have conversations with the land bank and other stakeholders as which 1,000 should we prioritize? Obviously the ones that are causing the most harm, but also where there might be strategic neighborhood redevelopment activities or community interests about urban gardening, et cetera, where the land bank can help advocate to move some of those parcels forward uh, in a very positive manner. The second one is, you know, if land banks don't fully understand what they want to do and then communicate that to the community, others will tell the story for them. Right? So it's really important to always make sure that you, that the land banks themselves are communicating clearly the role they can play and the goals that they've prioritized. Albany County Land Bank has done an excellent job with an incredible website. They're constantly hosting community forums. They, when it was allowed before COVID, they were having uh, even uh, workshops on site of land bank properties about how to apply, about rehab uh, dollars that might be brought to bear. Um, so just an example of constantly communicating with those they're serving in order to ensure that there's trust and there's an understanding of their roles and goals. The third one is this myth of self-financing. You know, there's, we get a lot of requests. We want to create a land bank and, you know, we just might need a little bit of startup money, but then we'll be fine after two years. Um, I, try, I just tell people with a very sobering assessment, and please do not assume that this is going to be a self-financing endeavor. Again, if these properties had value, if they, you could extract profit from them, trust me, the private market would be there, either the good ones or the bad actors. Um, these always need some level of public investment, particularly if you want equitable outcomes. The more equitable your outcomes, the more public investment will be needed. And equity has value, and it should be recognized as such. I'm gonna jump to the uh, next slide. One of the best solutions in the field is Ohio's statewide funding solution. It was included in their 2009 land bank enabling legislation with a lot of foresight, some great work by folks on the ground there in Ohio. Uh, and it basically allows them to commit 5% of delinquent fees and taxes to a dedicated fund that goes towards, that can then, a portion of which can go towards land banks. Now, land banks in Ohio can only be created at the county level because tax foreclosure and enforcement happens at the county level. So it makes sense that that's where land banks needing to be integrated into the tax foreclosure system are allowed to be created. 
And over two thirds of those, I believe, have authorized or made the full commitment of 5% of DTAC. This is a large sum of money for some of these land banks. Cuyahoga County, again, they anticipate about 7 million annually from DTAC as they prepare their budgets. And I looked at 2019 and 2020, it was the same amount that they're budgeting. This is a huge sum. I know folks out there, if there are land bank practitioners, you were like, I wish I had access to 7 million annually. Um, but that is also why we see some great innovation happening in, in Ohio from land banks is because they're not having to chase the dollars. They can actually dream big, innovate, and chase creative partnerships. So before, before you go forward, um, there was a just a clarifying question from uh, Patrick Anim about uh, Ohio land banks. I think in particular, he was looking to see if there was a current list of land banks in Ohio or any information. I think Mary may have had the same question around Ohio land banks. Yeah, thank you, Justin. So the Western Reserve Land Conservancy has a program, the Thriving Communities Institute. Um, incredible. They are basically the hub of a lot of the land bank activity. They do have a running list of all the land banks. They have a land book playbook. I'd also call out that Ohio has a land bank association uh, led, uh, um, I, and I think if you would just Google Ohio Land Bank Association, you can get their website and they have additional resources there. So a common mistake, uh, number four is just, again, it gets back to that, and I sound like a broken record, but I'm telling you, we've seen it in the field and it has caused problems. It's again, recognizing that there is history, very sensitive history, that there's reasonable fears of folks, particularly, uh, people of color, where unfortunately, not coincidentally, a large uh, uh, inventory of vacant and abandoned property typically exists in a community, you have to approach this uh, with a lot of care. Uh, you have to be seen as a genuine partner and authentically engaging in that neighborhood. Otherwise, the fears that they have are incredibly legitimate and absolutely reasonable, and we need to repeat the, the mistakes of the past. One of the ways in which some land banks are doing that, there's community advisory boards, and I'll tell you, this is, this is one of the harder aspects of land banking to do genuinely and authentically. But where we've seen some great progress is where Lucas County Land Bank, Syracuse Land Bank, they've actually dedicated resources towards a full-time staff. So they have a director of community engagement. They've lifted up as worthy of that kind of investment, serves as a great liaison to all the neighborhoods, and is just a great way to show that commitment to partnerships with residents. Again, don't go it alone. You have to put these structures back out there or this vacant land. You need partners in order to do that. So very quickly, some very neat examples that we've shown over the years, Macon Bibb County Land Bank, you know, over uh, probably 12, 13 years, this partnership in a historically African-American neighborhood. It also had uh, a lot of historic buildings in it is experiencing disinvestment and they used a public housing investment as kind of the catalyst for a deep and diverse coalition focusing on this neighborhood where even the institutional anchors played a role with providing home ownership grants to all the employees the lower income employees at the hospital at the university where they could be a part of that neighborhood and build, rebuild that fabric the results have been great it did not result in displacement. There was inclusive practices thought in proactively. And so it was just a great way of kind of also that we need patience and persistence and partnerships, right? I mean, that's how this work is done. Again, one of our innovators in the field, just because they have done some great work with housing partnerships, you know, they recognize that a lot of nonprofits in the area serve folks in need but where housing was also an issue. And so we're having kind of a housing first, right, approach. It is how can they work with some of these nonprofits, ensure that the clients they're serving have stable housing, which can only then improve the work uh, that they're doing to support them in their lives. So they've worked with nonprofits for uh, women in crisis, domestic violence victims, women who are justice involved in transitioning from incarceration, for veterans, for refugees, just a great partnership recognizing that the land bank is, is, has, uh, is broker of massive inventory of assets and there are nonprofits serving a large population of people in need and connecting those two 
uh, certainly is, is resulting in improved lives and more equitable outcomes. In Huntington Lab Bank, a great partnership with a local nonprofit um, that was working again with justice involved in individuals returning from prison. Uh, and basically they were able to get state uh, workforce grants to cover the crews to deal with all of the maintenance on their land bank property. So it not only saved the land bank more than $100,000, and uh, it was just an incredible opportunity, uh, again, to provide equitable opportunities for folks in the community. What was great to hear that many of the participants also were able to secure work, long-time work from local contractors or lawn maintenance providers, given the skills that they learned through this program. So just an incredible win. So moving forward, you know, we always say that there needs to be some strong focus on establishing dedicated funding streams for land banks, right? Land banks, maybe 10 years ago, were seen kind of as this, uh, you know, transactional entity operating on the fringe of community development. And now we're seeing land banks, you know, after 10 years, really shifting to this transformational role at the center of community development. And we see a lot of opportunities with land banks and community land trusts uh, supporting inclusive communities. There's a lot of effort now that we've seen those large scale demolition campaigns in communities like Ohio and Detroit and in other areas where there's large swaths of vacant land is what do we do with this massive inventory of vacant land? How can we turn this into a permanent asset for the communities? And then Better evaluating impacts and outcomes. This is what the field is, is, is really uh, discussing now. So very quickly, and then we'll close up. So folks talking about land banks and CLT partnerships. They're definitely, we have been working with our counterpart at the national level, Grounded Solutions Network. And they also maintain kind of a community land trust uh, uh, association or network. And so by partnering together, we've been working in different communities where we're building stronger partnerships between land banks and community land trusts. These are just a few of those examples. We've also recently, this last year, in outside Pittsburgh, in Allegheny County, there's another partnership, and we're exploring another partnership in Buffalo, New York. Um, so the key here for me is that, you know, again, equitable, equitable outcome, it has value in and of itself. We can't keep saying we want to, you know, address racial equity, that we want to truly uh, deal with the disparities in, in wealth and opportunities if we're not willing to invest in that. So what is community, uh, what is community progress doing to meet this moment? Um, quite a bit. <laughs> uh, we have been, uh, for the last almost year and a half, we've been working on the National Land Bank Network we're so excited to announce the executive director, Brian Larkin, who was brought on at the start of the year, just doing an incredible amount of work. This really is an effort to, one, connect existing land banks, to allow for peer-to-peer -peer learning, to provide technical support, but it's also to help tell our story, to amplify the narrative and the importance of land banks and the incredible work that they're doing on the ground, and also to build power to uh, advocate in, in, in Washington, D.C. for federal legislation that will continue to support this movement. Same time, we just launched last month uh, my shop, the Land Bank Incubator Scholarship Program. So this is really to help new land banks or states that do not have existing land bank legislation that want to pursue uh, new state enabling legislation. Um, so feel free to go to the website there, check out whether you're eligible. This scholarship would provide free technical assistance um, to those uh, applicants that we deem are really highly competitive and show promise of success. And the application process is a rolling application, um, so feel free if you are interested to pursue that uh, once you start building a strong uh, local commitment towards those goals. We're also communicating opportunities. You know, we recently posted about all of the federal aid that is coming to local, all 19,000 unit governments across this country. This is separate and apart from all of the other buckets of funds as part of the American Rescue Plan, um, but there are dedicated awards going to each municipality. We've been working with land banks across the country to start to encourage them to be part of those conversations. Because just as we saw with the Great Recession, there's obviously immediate needs to stabilize and secure folks. 
Just as with this pandemic, there is absolutely immediate and urgent needs to help tenants, landlords, workers, small businesses, employers, right? But there's also going to be that fallout of properties that come in year two and year three. And the land banks can play a critical role, but there should be a portion of this federal aid granted to local municipalities that contemplates that eventual inventory of properties that are gonna slip through and become a problem and a nuisance for your neighbors and neighborhoods. We're also advocating for the field, been working our policy team, our policy director, <laughs> team of one, uh, Rob Finn has been doing some great work with many of our congressional uh, partners and the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act is an incredible uh, legislation introduced by Congresswoman Kapter in Tlaib uh, and certainly encourage you to check that out and possibly even encourage your local folks to, to sign on or get your federal folks to sign on because this would drive dedicated funding to land banks, to community land trusts, right, and to other nonprofit groups that are working in some of the most disinvested neighborhoods. We have a whole slew of publications available on our website, um, and we encourage you to sign up to our e-newsletter so you can stay informed about all of this work and exciting opportunities and resources. So I will finish with a little challenge um, to the field. We are living in communities that we know have high disparities between neighborhoods, and that is often uh, defined by race, right? The legacy of redlining and Jim Crow laws and segregation is real, and it harms our, our communities. We also have systemic poverty. In many cases, the issue is not necessarily a vacancy and abandonment, but it's just poverty and that there is no money for property repairs, right? Um, so we have to recognize that this is a top crisis that we're trying to solve as well. Housing justice has become part of the national conversation like we have never seen in decades. It is awesome to see that, but it just goes to show how serious of a crisis this is in our communities. If it's not substandard rental properties, right, in weak housing markets or, or vacant abandoned properties, it's housing affordability crises in some of our stronger cities. Every community is dealing with housing crisis. And then finally, climate change, right? Uh, there are so many communities that are experiencing the threats and vulnerabilities of the impacts of climate change, and they are going to impact our neighborhoods. They are going to impact the inventory of properties and whether we have just, secure, affordable, safe, healthy neighborhoods for all. What is the connection? Land is one of them. We need to start, community, uh, governments need to start seeing land, in my opinion, as another infrastructure asset. Just as they worry about roads and sewers and waters, uh, uh, sewer and water lines and bridges, land is a powerful asset that we have too often just immediately not wanted any control over. Throw it out to the private market. There is an opportunity here, particularly neighborhoods that are disinvested, to bring that land under public ownership, temporary stewardship, and to work with partners in the field so that we could, um, so that we could produce more equitable outcomes and address many of these overlying crises that impact and harm our residents, particularly people of color. So with that, I am going to do my best at trying to go through what seems to be about 30 different questions in chat. So um, excuse me, I'm just gonna go off video for, I'm gonna stop sharing. Go off video just for one minute and I'll come right back. Okay, there's a lot of questions about basically what, what should communities do next if they think that the land bank could be helpful? Um, or if the state doesn't have land bank legislation, what can they do? Now, 
this goes back to that distinction between land banks and land banking, right? Every local government can bring some property if if the tax foreclosure process allows them, could bring property in in house and then dispose of it subject to the local and often restrictive disposition policy, right? High bid, RFP, go through council. If if you don't have state enabling legislation, it's really hard to move forward with a land bank that is going to be effective. Um, I, 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 if there's one thing that I ask folks to take away is that the reason why land banks can do this work effectively and efficiently, it's because that they are granted special powers through that legislation. So it's really important uh, to start engaging some of your state leaders with conversations about the value of land banks. That is something that if there is strong interest from multiple local governments in your state, then maybe then the Land Bank Incubator Scholarship Program could be a resource for you. We could come in, we could help broker some educational sessions with state leaders. We can um, help them think through even uh, potential draft legislation. But it just is so critical to understand that that state enabling legislation is, is important to optimize the work that a land bank can do. Otherwise, you're either basically just working like a nonprofit or you're working like an in-government land banking program, which doesn't give you the flexibility needed and still keeps you trapped with those restrictive uh, acquisition and disposition practices. So um, there's questions about how do you respond to local government officials who say that the in-house land banking works fine. I hope I answered some of that. They are still subject to strict disposition requirements. Sometimes it's not always transparent and, and accountable. It's not always user friendly. They're usually not embedded and in close partnership with neighborhood groups and resident groups. Uh, everything has to go through a bureaucratic process, right? The land bank is meant to, again, be able to address all of that uh, to ensure more equitable, efficient, and effective outcomes. Um, how are, are land banks typically funded through budget, uh, public budget allocations? Um, yes, there are many land banks that receive sufficient funds just to deal with operations from their local governments, or at least part of it. There are many times county or municipal land banks are actually staffed by local or county uh, employees. Um, so it reduces the cost. So basically they're providing that in-kind support. But yes, in order to move forward with some of the work and the programs and the interventions, there definitely needs to be some funding. While uh, some have made local government commitments, there have been a couple like Macon Bid Georgia, they actually took out a blight bond ordinance. I believe it was something like 10 or $11 million. One million was allocated to each legislative district and then the land bank played a key role in advancing and implementing some of their priorities. There uh, have been a lot of funds committed through both the, um, uh, the, the hardest hit fund, as mentioned earlier, that federal program, but also through all of the mortgage settlements that happened following the Great Recession, right? Where there was the national settlements, um, a lot of attorney generals peeled off a portion of funds and directed that to land banks. Uh, in New York, they have, the land banks have been beneficiaries of multiple settlements beyond the national settlement just because the Attorney General of New York had overview uh, uh, of uh, Wall Street. So there have literally been tens of millions of dollars beyond the national settlement that has been directed to New York land banks. Now, all of those funds are drying up. Right? I mean, this is why it's so important that we are playing that advocacy role at the federal level hoping to up, open up some funding, either through the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act, there's a National Land Bank Network Act, there's a new tax credit, the National Homes Investment Act, that would, uh, similar to low-income housing tax credit that produces affordable rentals, this would be dedicated exclusively for those properties that land banks typically deal with, the one to three unit family rentals where they're trying to rehab these in weak housing market, they put a hundred, need to put 150,000 in and it will only sell for 100,000 or even less. Well, that tax credit would cover that gap. So this could be an incredibly powerful financing tool for land banks in the future uh, if that federal bill gains traction. So um, I, it's 1257. So Justin, how are we doing? One more or should we tie it up? I think you got time for one more. Okay. Um, 
are land banks that have targeted bank-owned properties. Yes, there have been some that, following the Great Recession, that uh, basically uh, made some excellent partnerships with local banks, uh, and they were able to take some of the properties as well, and some of those properties came with cash dollars. Most of that work by the financial institutions was driven or their sense of collaboration was driven by the fact that they had to meet certain financial commitments as part of the settlement. So they were kind of strong armed, I think, to that partnership. Uh, I do not want to take anything away from the land banks that have been able to broker those conversations. But I think we might see that where it was common 2016, 17, 18, we've seen that narrow. Uh, It still happens, but it's just been narrowing. Uh, who knows what's going to happen, though, again, with COVID and the fallout. We know there are many homeowners behind and forbearance. We know that there are many landlords. We know that there are many commercial properties that we didn't see in the Great Recession that are likely going to fall through and slip into foreclosure. Um, that's why, again, we're just encouraging all the land banks and local leaders to recognize that this one-time infusion of federal aid that you can use for three to four years, and there's more details on that on our website, Think about those long-term challenges that you're going to experience from problem properties in your neighbors and make sure you have the resources to mitigate those harms uh, in the future. So I want to thank everyone for being here. Stay healthy and hopeful. Um, And if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly via email. You will be getting the slide deck. You will be getting the recording link uh, available. And so thank you for your time and, and everybody be well. All right, I first just want to say a big thank you to Tarp for an excellent presentation. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us, joining us this afternoon. Um, it's our hope that you will join us on April 22nd for the next Cornerstone webinar. That webinar will be focused on prioritizing repair support for financially struggling property owners, um, which is shaping up to be a great presentation. Um, As always, please visit our website for more information on this and other upcoming webinars, and I hope that you all have a great afternoon.